I'm going to let everybody in. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to part three of Friends and Allies, Frank Murphy and the Jews in Michigan and beyond. We are so glad you've joined us again tonight with Greg Zipes. Um, before we get started, just wanted to remind you of a couple upcoming programs. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m., we have our very own Barbara Cohen interviewing artist Yigal and his daughter Sheer Ozeri at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And on February 10th, we have a talk from Charles Gallagher on the Nazis of Copley Square, the forgotten story of the Christian front, which is also the title of his newest book. And that will be at 7 p.m. as well. As always, this program is supported by Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs, as well as the National Endowment for the Arts. And if you have any questions, please hold them until the end of this evening's program and please submit them via the chat feature on your Zoom screens and I will moderate that conversation. And now I am going to turn things over to Greg Zipes for part three of our program. Thank you, Kara. Um, very pleased to be here. Uh, and this is part three, as Kara mentioned. We, um, are gonna continue with Frank Murphy's life. We, um, in the first uh, session, we covered his early formative years, his early contacts with uh, the Jewish community in Detroit and um, his overall philosophy about life and, and how he became uh, the politician that he became. Uh, this, during the second session, we discussed his time as governor in Michigan, that was in, 1937 or so, and his role in the great sit-down strikes and his contacts with um, the Jewish community, again, and as governor of Michigan. And uh, this time, we're going to discuss his later years. As we discussed before, he was born in 1890, and he was, he died in 1949. He was a, um, uh, uh, he, he died after World War II, and he was a Supreme Court Justice for the last part of his life. Um, this is not a legal course. We're not gonna be uh, discussing legal concepts as such, but I am going to be presenting to, to you certain questions that Frank Murphy faced and also um, juxtaposed his reactions with the sole Jewish Supreme Court Justice at the time, uh, Felix Frankfurter. So they were two very different men, but they were both, um, uh, ethnic, and, and they both sat on the Supreme Court, and they both had to deal with questions of America within the concept of, within the context of their backgrounds, their religions, and um, in the context of World War II and, and afterwards. So with that, I am going to uh, share a screen here, um, and let me do that. Um, let me just give me a second here. Okay, so um, just to summarize, uh, Frank Murphy, bushy eyes uh, and uh, bushy eyebrows. And on the left is a photo of, of him as governor of Michigan. Uh, it's, it's on the cover of my book as well. And um, I'll um, move on now to a, a timeline because I'm throwing a lot of dates at you a lot of different uh, concepts at you, and uh, I want to make sure that we're, um, I'm not overwhelming you with that. So uh, we'll return to a timeline for Frank Murphy and very briefly summarize that he was born in Sand Beach, which is now Harbor Beach, uh, Michigan in 1890. This is about 25 years after the Civil War. Um, Michigan, uh, Harbor Beach was a frontier town. It was on the shores of Lake Huron. It had a, 
a mix of immigrants from Europe. It was more um, immigrant than native um, and very different from, from some of the small towns in Michigan today. Um, Frank Murphy went to the University of Michigan. He went there for law school. Uh, during World War I, he served in the army. Um, he served on the criminal court in, Mich in Detroit where he was the judge for the Ossian Sweet trial, which was a, a formative civil, civil rights case that he, he was lauded by the NAACP and black groups for his actions uh, in conducting a fair trial for black defendants. And the NAACP um, had a legal strategy that took them to board versus, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 um, based in part on the success that they had in court. Blacks did not often succeed in court due to segregation and racism. And um, because Frank Murphy ran a fair trial, they concluded that they could get some justice in court. And that started their court strategy that led to uh, uh, Board of Education, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Frank Murphy would not live to, to get to um, that case, Brown, which ended segregation in schools. He would only live until 1949. Uh, you may hear sirens in the background. That's New York City sirens, um, just for you. So 1936 and 1937, he was governor of Michigan. And he was governor only for a few years. Back then, governors only served for two years. And he was a uh, one-term governor. So. Um, this is, an, this is a point where we will continue and, and his continuing rise. It's a little bit ironic that um, by losing the governorship, he actually continued his rise politically. And that, it, that has a lot to do with his connections to FDR. Um, uh, but what did he lose? He lost in part because he was not willing to um, provide pork, and I'm saying that before a Jewish group, pork meaning he, he was not willing to allocate jobs and, and money to Democratic supporters. Uh, he refused to do that. He, he said he has to run a clean ship, and he was always known for that. And this is one time where it really caught up to him. He just did not have the enthusiasm of Democratic um, operatives in Michigan. Um, he, wasn't, he didn't have the benefit in 1938 of running with FDR. It was an off election year, so he didn't have the benefit of a very popular president, and, and he lost. Uh, and there was reasons for that. Um, there was something called the port, court packing scheme of Roosevelt. He wasn't happy with how the Supreme Court was overruling his New Deal uh, legislation. And um, he was seen as being too authoritarian, too authoritarian by many in the country. That had an effect on Democrats who were running in 1938. Um, and also Roosevelt, tended to choose Democrats and go after other Democrats who he didn't think were following his program enough. And that all had a, had a backlash uh, effect against Democrats running. Murphy was a um, uh, loss as a result of that. In this photo, you can see him with LaGuardia. He, he, as we mentioned, he was the head of the mayor's uh, conference in 1932 and 1933, arranging for money to go from the federal government directly to um, the cities and bypassing the states. And he was always a great friend of, of city uh, mayors. LaGuardia, obviously, the, the airport's named after him in New York. He was the mayor of New York. And um, he was actually never a Democrat, but he was a New Dealer. So um, we now get to um, uh, Murphy's connections to Frankfurter. They, they are linked in many ways. Um, Frankfurter, as I mentioned, is the one Jewish Supreme Court justice. Uh, he was appointed in 1939, and the same day that Frank Murphy was also appointed as the Attorney General of the United States. And we should we should stop here and and just um, note this fact, both of these facts. Um, Europe was descending into great darkness in 1939, and Jews in the United States tended to. Um, want to keep their heads low. And um, when Frankfurter was thought, uh, was raised as a candidate for the Supreme Court, there were Jewish groups that actually went to FDR and said, please don't appoint him. He's, we don't need a Jew in a, in a 
high profile position uh, such as this. And um, uh, FDR, to his credit, um, he didn't necessarily listen to that, but he, um, he appointed Frankfurter exactly because he was Jewish in many ways. That um, FDR was famous for not really expressing why he did things. He just did things and, um, it, and it, he's beguiled uh, historians because he didn't keep a lot of notes, but he did appoint um, Frankfurter to the Supreme Court. And many did see it as symbolic that as Hitler was making a pariah of Jews and, and Goebbels and Cochrane, who we discussed, were being mentioned in the same breath and um, Charles Lindbergh and, and many other pro-fascists were prevalent in the United States. FDR made this eloquent statement by appointing Frankfurter to the Supreme Court. Um, so Frankfurter was far different from Murphy. We discussed Murphy's uh, background, his, his childhood, and um, Frankfurter arrived at Ellis Island. He was a New Yorker uh, from Vienna in 1894. And uh, his world was far different from Murphy's. He grew up in a very Jewish area of Lower East Side. Um, uh, over a million Jews who lived in, in the immediate area. And he, he was uh, exposed to ideologies uh, that competed against each other. And he was a brilliant uh, person. Uh, he graduated from City College at the age of 19. He was the third highest in his class. He, went, uh, he became a Harvard Law professor. And um, at the same time, he was discriminated against. He couldn't get jobs at white shoe law firms in Manhattan. Um, like Murphy, uh, Frank Flitter also had a very strong mother who notably advised him to keep his ethnic last name, which he did, and others, while others were encouraging the changes so he could enter mainstream legal societies in New York. Now, as for Murphy, why was he elevated by FDR? And that, that's a really interesting question because he had lost. He was a one-term governor um, and uh, what was it about him? And FDR, again, didn't keep a lot of notes, but um, we already saw how Murphy was a hero uh, among certain classes of Democrats. He was in the laborers, he was a hero of them, and he fit a certain New Deal conception of, of um, FDR. FDR wanted to have a show of strength and appoint someone who was associated with the New Deal and who was strongly allied with them. So um, he was appointed as attorney general and um, Murphy formed a civil rights division in uh, 1939. And he, um, he was a very active attorney general. He went after Graft um, and there are a lot of famous stories about that because FDR courted big city mayors who weren't necessarily on the up and up all the time. He, he put up with a lot of graft to get their votes. And Murphy was getting in the way a little bit. So within um, a year, he, um, FDR was looking for another place for Murphy. And, um, and, a, and a, a position opened up on the Supreme Court. So Murphy was appointed as a Supreme Court justice within a year after he became uh, attorney general. Um, and many said that he was appointed as a Supreme Court justice to get rid of him. He was just too much of a trouble in the attorney general's office. He was too much of a, a, a showman, but also he was um, going after big city mayors and he was with his civil rights division, he was causing animosity among FDR's Southern Democratic uh, allies in, who he needed in the Senate and the House of Representatives. So he was elevated. So now we have two, um, uh, two ethnic uh, people on the United States Supreme Court who are not gonna necessarily like each other, uh, but they, they're they now on the Supreme Court. We're not yet at World War One, World War II rather. It, World War II, the entry of the United States would be the end of 1941, uh, early 1942. Um, and, but the war clouds are gathering and everybody knows that war is coming. Um, so, here we have Murphy on the right in this photo and um, Frank Footer is sitting on the left uh, Supreme, uh, and the Chief Justice Harlan is sitting, Harlan Stone is sitting in between them. Um, and we should note um, 
something here. As I mentioned before, Frank Murphy was speaking out against what was going on in Europe. He was very vocal about it uh, for a variety of reasons. We saw after Chris, Kristallnacht, he um, led a uh, meeting of 7,000 people in Detroit to condemn that. There were a lot of Jewish figures at that. And um, Frankfurter, even though he was appointed for symbolic reasons, uh, partly as a Jew, he kept a very low profile as, as a Jew. He didn't, he didn't make any statements during World War II about the Jewish plight, very un unlike Frank Murphy. Um, and uh, there's uh, reasons uh, that are given for why he, he wasn't so, art or, or so outspoken during World War II. But part of it is that he didn't want to draw attention to himself as a Jew. He, he fit into a certain mindset of Jews generally in the United States that they needed, they, they had a seat at the table, they had a seat at the political table, but they needed to keep quiet when uh, relating to events that are, were happening abroad. Um, and just to show you, this is a, uh, this is from the JTA, which is the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. It, it, during 1944, they um, are, publicizing the fact that Frank Murphy was speaking out against what was going on in Europe. People had a pretty decent idea that um, there was more than just uh, bad things happening to Jews in, in Europe uh, in, during World War II. There were actual slaughters going taking place. And there, there was a pretty good idea by 1943 and 1944 that this was not just uh, limited pogroms or or prejudice against Jews. Um, and Murphy was speaking out very strongly about it and he was winning awards uh, from Jewish groups for speaking out about it. Frankfurter, not so much. Um, so I wanna, I wanna focus you on, uh, this is not gonna be a legal class and, and I want you to focus on questions that Frank Murphy and, um, and Felix Frankfurter had to get, address as Supreme Court justices. Um, these, these are actual questions and I'm putting this up here at, uh, on the screen and I, I think Kara has a poll that we can do right now. So let me just set the, the table here for you before you vote on this. Should public school students be required to put their hand on their heart and salute the United States flag every morning? And students say the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and at least when I was growing up, there wasn't too much of an issue with that. I, I didn't remember anybody really protesting that or parents protesting that. But um, there is, there are religions that think that this is not appropriate. Um, it's, it's when you salute the flag, you're worshiping a, um, an idol or something like that. And it's not the Jewish religion, but it's other religions. And there are religions in the United States that do that. On the other side of this equation is, as an American, as an immigrant, uh, is there anything wrong with requiring students to salute the flag? And, and so those, your conception of America is in part uh, is, is wrapped up in this question. So I, I'd be curious to know if you're, if you've got enough um, gumption to vote here, what, uh, how you would vote. And I don't think you could see the poll going. We'll give it a minute. It is on, the poll is yeah. on. Right now the results are 60, or now they're 50-50. Yeah, interesting. It looks like we're at 50% 50, 50 of people say yes, 50% of people say no. Okay, okay, so um, so it's interesting because we all bring our, our Judaism into this question, we bring our, um, well, it's, it's changing a little bit, but it's not, um, you know, not substantial there. There's still a pretty good split there. Um, so this is a question that, that um, uh, that Frank Murphy and Felix Frankfurter had to address during, it, this was during World War II. The case was, um, was West Virginia versus Barnett. And it's, again, we're not doing a legal class here, but it's a question that um, your, your common sense would answer as well, or your, your sense of as, as an American. And so um, Felix Frankfurter thought 
that it was important, his conception of America was it was important to that people be required to put their hand on their heart and um, and uh, and salute the flag as well. Uh, whereas Frank Murphy, uh, maybe it's because of his Catholic beliefs or, or maybe not, he said that uh, students should not be required to have to do this and, and states should not be allowed to impose this law. So um, uh, in the end, um, Frank Murphy's point of view actually won out here. And some of the context of this was that during World War II, obviously there's, there's a Nazi salute um, and that was making the news. And there was a sense that saluting the American flag looked a little too much like um, saluting the Nazi flag. You could, you could see today there might be other considerations. It's not necessarily during a world war in the same way, but nevertheless, it's interesting that uh, the two parties uh, uh, thought that way. Um, let, me, let me just do one, one or two more questions if we can. So, because these are again, questions that um, Frank Murphy and Felix Frankfurter had to consider as Supreme Court members. So should a state um, fund busing for a parochial school? And um, again, state money, should it go to uh, allowing busing for students who go full-time to uh, Catholic school or, or Hebrew school or something like that? Um, and so I'm throwing out Hebrew school to maybe prompt you to um, think about this in a different way, but you can see that your state funds, should they, should they go to, um, for busing to um, religious schools? And so could we put the poll up, um, Kara? I don't know if I, oh, okay. It is up right now. So, Okay, good. So should the state be allowed to fund busing to a parochial school? So we're all, almost universally saying no. And um, so what happened with this, this was, this was also a Supreme Court case that involved, um, people are still voting, but it's still coming in pretty much as a no. 82% uh, no's. So, um, so we'll stop this, that polling. So this, this again is based on a Supreme Court case and it, that case is called Everson. It was in 1947 after World War II. Um, you should know that Catholic schools um, benefit the most from this if, if this law is imposed because 96% of the private schools at the time, the parochial schools were Catholic. There were some Jewish schools obviously, but most were Catholic. And um, the um, Murphy didn't want to vote on this. He said, I, I know that this involves a lot of Catholic schools and however I vote on this is going to look like I'm taking sides or supporting my religion. And Frank Flitter did want to vote on it. He, he And he voted um, against funding for parochial schools. He said, public schools are so important and fundamental to American democracy that you can't you shouldn't be encouraging money for other types of schools. But the court was completely split. It was split 4-4. And so Frank Footer goes to Murphy, he actually goes to Murphy and says, I want you to vote on this. And I want you to be like me. Um, we're both ethnics, ethnic uh, Supreme Court justices. I'm voting against funding for parochial schools, even though that might hurt my, my, uh, my religious group. And you, Frank Murphy, should do the same. And um, so Frank Murphy thought about it and he said, I wasn't gonna vote, but now I, I will vote on this. And he actually voted in favor of um, funding for parochial schools. So he, he Frank, uh, Frank Footer was not happy with this result. Um, and this shows that Frank Murphy was not necessarily always on the side of uh, the underdog or, or, um, uh, or, or the oppressed or, in favor of public school, even though he was, he went to public school himself. But um, I'm gonna do one more of these now and um, we're gonna see what happens. Um, this case, oops, let me just go back. Okay, so should a, should a school be used, a, a public school be used as a space for religious instruction? So if, if there's an empty classroom in a public school, 
uh, and someone wants to use it for religious instruction, otherwise they're not using state resources, should that be allowed or should it not be allowed? We're having, um, we have a few more minutes. So most of you are voting no, the, the, the classroom should not be used, empty classrooms should not be used for religious instruction. And um, so this, this case came one year after the case we just described where Murphy agreed that public funds can be used for busing kids to parochial schools, Catholic schools and Hebrew schools or whatever it might be. Um, and he, he had a change of heart here on this one. So um, Frank Footer continued to work on him. And in a case called McCollum in 1938, uh, 1948 rather, I'm sorry, uh, the Frank Murphy actually sided with Frank Footer and said space cannot be used for religious instruction. And some of this passes down to our this day. These, these debates are still raging uh, and, and it's tied into people's sense of what is an American and what's allowed in public areas and um, whether you're proselytizing even or encouraging certain religions by, by acting this way. So um, these are uh, issues that Frank Murphy and, um, and uh, Frank Flitter had, had to consider. I'm gonna shift gears now a little bit. Um, we are entering the World War II era with Frank Murphy and Frank Footer on the Supreme Court. As I said, they both came on around 1939, 1940. And um, so let's, let's just look at World War II because this is the next major period of Frank Murphy's life. And um, I prepared this little timeline. I don't expect you to read the whole thing, but let's just go over basic uh, history, which we're all aware of. 1941 was the Japanese fleet attacks Pearl Harbor and US declares war. Um, 1942, there's a, re there's a commission issued a uh, report. Owen Roberts was a Supreme Court justice. And just like after 9-11, there was a blue collar panel to figure out what went wrong with Pearl Harbor. There was a commission to determine uh, why the United States wasn't ready when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And um, Japanese hysteria against Japanese Americans was running high right now. And we're gonna, we, we talked about uh, discrimination against Jews and blacks. And now we're gonna talk about discrimination against um, Japanese Americans and Frankfurter's response and, and also Murphy's response to this. That's, that's what we're gonna focus on. So what's important to note here is that Japanese Americans there wasn't one example of traitorous activity by Japanese Americans at any point. And even looking back through history where we can shift through what they were doing, there was no example of Japanese American treachery. But nevertheless, after, World, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, there was a lot of um, uh, anti-Japanese hysteria and um, people wanted to do something to address the issue. Um, February 1942, there was an executive order by FDR. There's no real thought that he, he, he was reflective about it, but he issued orders uh, allowing the removal of Japanese Americans from the West Coast. And there was about 120,000 Japanese Americans altogether living on the West Coast, the vast majority of which were born in this country. So if you think about it, um, birthright citizenship, uh, you have certain constitutional rights that come with this. And we see that um, uh, in 1942, they were all shipped to internal camps in the interior parts of the country from their homes on the West Coast. Now, obviously this cannot compare to what happened to the Jews in, in Europe. And um, in researching for my book, I spoke with many Japanese Americans who are very familiar with this and they would all say that this is not the same, but nevertheless, this is a really dark stain in United States history. And it was brought on by prejudice. As I mentioned, there was no example of Japanese American sabotage during World War II. There was no, there was no pay, basis to do this. And it was done to American citizens without any due process, without any individualized hearings. 
children were shipped off, um, elderly people were shipped off, and it didn't really even matter what your status was. If you were Japanese American and you lived on the West Coast, you were you were going to get shipped off. Um, so um, I went back and step forward here. Let's see. Um, and they're going to mostly be removed in the year 1942. So uh, again, Pearl Harbor was 1941, and they were removed in the year 1942. And the Supreme Court has something to say when when American citizens are 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 their rights are violated, but it often takes a while to get to the Supreme Court. So we're going to talk a, a little bit about the the. Supreme Court cases, and again, this is not a law class, but it does reflect um, Murphy and Frankfurter's conceptions of America. Um, the, this was a, a multi-step process before the Japanese Americans were taken from the West Coast and, and shipped to inter interior camps. First, um, many of them were rounded up without any kind of notice. Leaders of the community, right after Pearl Harbor, there was a list of leaders that were simply taken and wives and mothers um, had no idea what happened. They, they would just be, uh, their husband would go to work in the store and he, he wouldn't come home and, and they would get no information whatsoever as to what happened to him because he was on a list and he, and he was taken away. Now this was not just Japanese Americans that this happened to. Right after Pearl Harbor, there was also German Americans and Italian Americans who were shipped off. But as we know, there was a totally different way that the United States dealt with German Americans and Italian Americans, even though there were examples of treachery by Jap German Americans and Italian Americans. For the most part, German Americans and Italian Americans were inducted into the army. They were allowed to fight against German soldiers, Nazis, uh, Italians were allowed to fight against Italian soldiers. And there was a big effort to make sure that there was no kind of um, backlash by those groups. Um, so um, let me just focus on the executive order for a moment that FDR signed and he's, it's one of his darkest um, hours that he would sign an executive order like this, but he deputized the secretary of war to take actions again and prescribe military areas, which the entire West Coast was uh, declared a military area where Japanese Americans were shipped off to um, uh, interior camps. Um, but what's interesting about this executive order is that you don't see the word Japanese American in here at all. And, it's, and it doesn't actually require the shipping off of Japanese Americans. It was once the bureaucracy got this executive order that prejudiced people and their inclinations kicked in and Japanese American, it eventually led to Japanese Americans being sent to internment camps. Um, and we, we shouldn't make any mistake about where uh, they were sent. There were 70,000 United States citizens that were sent to uh, camps and there was all sorts of uh, censorship. So this is actually a very rare photo here of Japanese Americans uh, inside a camp. You usually would not see photos of the fences and the barbed wire and the, and the bar tower up here. Um, and because they were all censored and, and cameras, Americans filming these places self-censored as well. They, the government said, don't take photos of fences, but as you can see, this is, this is, um, this is prison. And again, there was no due process or anything else. It was just, they were all shipped off. Um, and this has echoes of Europe where oftentimes Japanese Americans were business owners and they owned farms and they were given 10 days to get their stuff together. Um, and they faced questions uh, as to what to do. The government was, was guaranteeing that if they were taken away that they would their property would be preserved. But if you're on the ground in that situation and you're Japanese American and you're seeing that you're about to be shipped away, would you just sell your property? Um, and many did at fire sale prices uh, that has echoes of Jews in Europe as well, who also sold their property uh, and which some of them have gotten, some of their relatives have gotten redressed recently with paintings and whatnot, but Japanese Americans had many of the same dilemmas. And throughout this time, again, no Japanese treachery. There was Japanese were very cooperative. Japanese Americans were very cooperative and they 
went to the camps without um, fighting because they wanted to prove their patriotism. They wanted to show that they weren't troublemakers. And uh, so um, again, echoes of Jews in Europe. Um, and I, I just want to show, this is in Manzanar, which is one of the internment camps that Japanese Americans were, were um, sent to. Uh, and this is a photo of Ansel Adams, who was more famous for his photos of the Great West, uh, but he also took photos at this camp. And this, is, this, is, this one is um, uh, telling in its own way. So he's not allowed to take photos of the barbed wire that surrounded them and was definitely there at this camp. Uh, they're playing baseball, which is an American birthright. And um, uh, uh, I look at this as kind of a protest photo. It's, it's eloquent. Okay, so we are moving on to um, a case called Hirabayashi. Hirabayashi was 1943. So again, I'm not asking you to read these cases, but um, uh, Hirabayashi was the name of a Japanese American who challenged the curfew. So before they, the Japanese Americans were shipped off on the West Coast, they were subject to nighttime curfews. They couldn't leave their houses. And uh, as we also know, in World War II, um, things like that were done, the, the Jewish star, the yellow star, as a prelude and to prepare the population for the next steps. Um, on the West Coast, they were required to be in curfew and that was challenged by a Japanese American after they were shipped off to the internment camps, uh, the internal camps. Uh, the Supreme Court found it was okay. They, there were military justifications. There was fear of a Japanese attack uh, on the West Coast. And um, we're gonna get to Murphy and Frank Footer in a minute on this, but just note that the, the Supreme Court is rubber stamping all these actions by the federal government. Um, but we see Murphy file what's called a concurrence in Hirabayashi. And here in, it's 1943, and he said, he makes the obvi what's obvious to us now, but wasn't obvious back then, that the curfew is depriving citizens of liberty um, because of their racial inheritance. And it bears a melancholy resemblance to the treatment accorded to members of the Jewish race in, in Europe. Um, and, so he's making the obvious point, but no, no one else is making this point on the Supreme Court. They're not using their bully pulpit, including Frank Twitter. Um, so let me just um, quickly move on to um, Kori Matsu. Many of you may have heard of that case in 1944. Uh, that, that's a case that, uh, that where the Supreme Court said that the interments were basically okay. There was no problem with them. And um, I, it helps to look at the individuals and see their faces. Uh, so Fred Korematsu, um, born, born in America, American citizen. Um, it, uh, everybody stipulated that he had no uh, traitor's intent. He was registered voter and he, he was willing to serve in the military uh, and, um, uh, and he was shipped off. So he challenged the, the um, internment of his, him and his family. And I wanted to show you the other case, um, uh, which is uh, Endo. And she is, she again was born in the United States. She worked, she lived in California and uh, she was dismissed by the, the state of California just right after Pearl Harbor, along with about 50 other uh, women in her position, uh, Japanese American women who were working for the state. Uh, so, and she was shipped off with her family. Um, and uh, they were the ones who challenged uh, the interments. And again, as we look at our timeline here, 1943, the curfew cases here by Ashi, where, where I mentioned Murphy was uh, pointing out the similarities to Europe. Um, and we get to Korematsu in 1944, and we should note here that um, by 1944, even if the Supreme Court said, this was wrong, you, you've now had Japanese Americans interned for over two years. And so any kind of, the damage is already done. They've sold their homes, they've lost uh, their neighbors. And, uh, but the Supreme Court didn't have a problem with it. The intern, internments we know from reviewing them today, they, they continued. And 
and they were a part of the American fabric during World War II. Um, oh, I wanted to just point out, this is Justice Black who, who said it was okay to intern Japanese Americans. And he uh, made, makes a statement that uh, in, in the Supreme Court decision, and again, we're not doing legal sort of uh, analysis here, but he says that, that there were members of the group who retained loyalties to Japan has been confirmed by investigations made subsequent to the exclusion. Approximately 5,000 Amer American citizens of Japanese, Japanese ancestry refused to swear unqualified allegiance to the United States and to renounce allegiance to the Japanese empire. So if you just look at this from a logical point of view, they've been shipped off and he's saying for justification that after subsequent to the exclusion, after they were shipped off, uh, 5,000 Jap Americans of Japanese ancestry refused to swear allegiance. That's not a reason, that's, that's a reason after the fact um, to send them off. And you might say, okay, well, if that's the case, uh, I guess it's not so bad even if it was after the fact, I guess people were right. But what he's referring to is a, is a, a questionnaire that went out to every Japanese American um, after they were imprisoned in, their, in the internment camps. And the questions were these, uh, are you willing to serve in the armed force of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? This went to every single Japanese American in internment camps, um, regardless of their age. Uh, they were above the age 18, but they went to women, they went to elderly people. It's a ridiculous question. So some of them answered no to this question. Um, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the United States from attack from foreign domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese empire? Um, there, were, there were Japanese Americans born in Japan and they had no right to citizenship due to racist laws. They, they, there was no path to citizenship, unlike uh, now, if you come from another country, you, you have an ability to be naturalized as a citizen. It might be easy, it might not be, but under the laws at the time, you could never become an American citizen. So they were shipped off. All their kids were American citizens um, and born in the United States, but they're, they're being asked uh, unqualified allegiance to the United States of America. They're, they're not even American citizens. So there were no's to this as well. And that's, this is what, um, uh, Justice Black was talking about when he said some Japanese Americans weren't loyal to the country, which is completely ridiculous. Um, okay, so we get to Murphy's dissent in Korematsu, and he points out um, what 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 I've been mentioning, which is that um, the country had an ability to review if a Japanese American was giving trouble or to the country you could have individualized hearings. And if there's some traitorous activity, you can bring them before a court of law and, and do what you would have done with German and Americans, German and Italian Americans. And then he said, um, we didn't even ship them off until four months to eight months after Pearl Harbor. So if there was a big emergency with Japanese Americans, why did we wait so long to do that? And it's a very good point. And then he said that there was never any proof of Japanese American treachery either. And he puts this in his opinion where he's dissenting. He's now saying, this is wrong. He's taking the position in the Supreme Court. I'm not gonna put up with this. This is not right. And he didn't win, but it, he was eloquent in how he, how he um, said that all this was wrong. But um, his most famous um, this, uh, statement, and I think one of the best statements of an American, uh, a conception of America is, um, in the Korematsu uh, case where he says, I dissent from this legalization of racism. And um, he talks about how all citizens are heirs to the American experiment and have a right to full, full rights. Uh, so he was very eloquent and, and not at all um, ambiguous in how he thought about this whole internment of Japanese Americans. Um, and any brought it up later as well. As I mentioned, he died in 1949, but he, he kept bringing it up that uh, there was a case in 1948 involving Japanese Americans. And he brought up again, still, still no example of any um, Japanese American treachery during World War II, by the way. And he, he was constantly bringing it up. So um, now we get to Frankfurter. And um, 
he did allow for the interments and you might be surprised to hear that, but he, um, he very much took the view that we have to have faith in the American democracy and American democracy has concluded Congress and the president that there is some uh, need to isolate Japanese Americans and it's not my uh, place on the Supreme Court to say that Congress and the president are wrong uh, and he, he wasn't willing to second guess uh, the president in that, in that regard. Um, so um, I, I mentioned that I had the help of a rabbi um, uh, who uh, on this, and then so I'm gonna throw in a little bit of um, Aramaic here. But basically uh, there's, an, uh, there's a Jewish concept that the law of the land is the law. And it's, uh, you could see that in some other religions as well. But I think that reflected Frankfurter to a certain degree. He was, he said, I'm proud of this country and I have faith in its institutions. And, and so that was what was driving him to allow what was a, a huge injustice that he, he missed in this example and that uh, Frank Murphy did not. Um, so um, I, I just wanna mention Endo because I, I mentioned the, the uh, Miss Endo, the California secretary. And in that example, the Supreme Court did release her. It was the day before um, President Roosevelt actually said, Japanese Americans are free to leave the internment camps. It was towards the end of 1944. Um, the court for technical reasons allowed her to be released. Uh, I think one of the reasons is just that she was a female and they, they had the sense of um, that we should allow a female to be released. But again, Murphy made clear that this was a racist internment and that that was the reason why he was releasing her where the other ones were finding sort of technical reasons to release her. Um, and just to make this clear before I wrap up, Japanese Americans served with great valor during World War II. Uh, they weren't um, publicly allowed to serve in, in the Pacific theater, but they actually did serve in the Pacific theater as translators. And um, they weren't allowed to publicize that because that would be an embarrassment to the government apparently. But um, here are Japanese Americans. They were segregated units, units just like blacks were still segregated during World War II. Here they are in France, uh, 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 the 442nd, uh, which is a famous uh, Japanese American group uh, fighting force. And um, here they are with German prisoners, Japanese Americans, you can see. Um, and also uh, on the right, uh, you'll see Inui, who is a 1946, this is, a, this is actually in Michigan, it's a rehabilitation camp. Um, he became a senator, a Democratic senator of Hawaii. Um, and over here is Bob Dole, who just passed away. They were, they knew each other since 1946. Bob Dole was a Republican. Um, and uh, if you want to see cooperation across the aisle, these two remained friends throughout their entire life. And uh, there, there are times when they crossed the aisle to um, support each other as well. So. Um, Japanese Americans served with great valor during World War II for the United States. Um, and including, uh, there was a Japanese unit that freed Dachau and uh, some of the soldiers, Japanese American soldiers who entered Dachau, um, the, the um, death camp were, they actually had family in internment camps in the United States. So there's an ir irony there. Um, so I, as I said, Frank Murphy passed away in 1949 and um, this has been a, an interesting lecture for me. I, I, um, uh, it was interesting to describe Murphy's uh, connections with the Jews and, and just think about, it, it helped me to try to think about different aspects. What is a good American? What are some of the things that good Americans do? Uh, different people fight over that, that idea even now, but um, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. And and Kara, do I do we have any questions from people based on this? Um, just a reminder that if you do have any questions, please submit them via the chat feature.
and you're listening to me talk for a long time. So it's uh, it's an interesting dynamic. I, I would normally be talking in front of a group and I could look at you and uh, see if you're, re how you're responding, but it's, um, uh, um, I, I can't necessarily see that right now. Um, question just came in. Can you speak more to Frankfurter as a Jewish role model? Yeah, so um, there is a book coming out by Frank Footer, and I, he's a law professor at, at Georgetown who's, who's coming out with it. And I, I spoke with him very briefly about it. Um, so uh, Frank Footer is a protege of, of Brandeis. Brandeis was the first Jewish American justice, uh, also brilliant. And he uh, was, was a big Zionist. Um, and when he, be, and he was also wealthy. When he became on, when he entered the Supreme Court, he used to speak with Frankfurter, who was then a professor, and get Frankfurter involved with Zionist causes. And Frankfurter uh, did get involved with Zionist causes. I think his legacy as a Jewish role model is is mixed, though. He's uh, he did not assert himself during World War II when he was aware of bad things that were happening uh, during. To the Jews in Europe, uh, unlike Frank Murphy, who was doing that. Um, and you could say sometimes it's easier for someone on the outside to um, criticize um, or speak out against the persecution of a certain group. Jews were hunkered down during World War II. They, uh, in, in this country, they were afraid of some of the currents that were passing in this country that were obviously out there in the world as well. And a lot of them wanted to keep silent and keep their head low. Frank Murphy was never that type of person. Uh, and I think Frank Footer was a little bit more of that person. It, the comment was made that as Jews, we should be more proud of Murphy than of Frank Furter almost. <laughs> uh, any other questions from you all in the audience this evening? We'll just wait another minute to see if anything else comes through via the chat feature. I am, oh, there we go. One just came through. Um, can you say more about the currents that kept Frank down? Um, I'm not sure that I understand um, that question completely. Why was he silent? Are, are we to, if we're talking about Frank Footer, why was he silent? I, I, I don't think he, Frank Footer wrote a lot and he tried to justify his actions. He's, he, he was uh, a, a larger than life figure. Um, and he's, he's got diaries, he's got letters that go to people and they're written in a very self-conscious um, self way to aid his legacy. Um, but he, he really didn't say a lot about this time in his life. He didn't talk about Korematsu, he didn't talk about the Japanese American internments. And uh, so I think it is a bit of a mystery. And, and as I wrote a biography, I'll just throw this out there. Every single person, when you try to get to the essence of why someone does something, why did Frank Murphy go in this direction in his life as opposed to become a businessman? He went, he was a University of Michigan graduate and um, uh, he, was, he was a University of, of Michigan graduate. He could have entered the business community of Detroit um, and yet he followed this path. And I, I think the same could be said by all of us. If, if you were subject to a, a biography, um, times in your life, why did you choose this person? Why did you move to Detroit? Why did you move out of Detroit? There's sometimes you don't even know. And that's, that's a basic mystery of people that I found really interesting as I wrote about Frank Murphy. So um, I wish I could be talking to you directly right now because I see people are trying to interject here. And, uh, but... Uh, let me let me just see. Another question that came through is, why do you think Frank Murphy is not better known even among Catholics? Yeah, um, there was, um, he was not uh, well regarded after one of those decisions that we talked about when he, when he said there should not be uh, uh, religious instructions in empty, public classrooms, that was condemned by um, Catholic hierarchy.
but um, it is, and, and he also had Father Coughlin and the supporters of Father Coughlin in the Detroit area. So he had a, a complex relationship with Catholic leadership. Although after World War II, when the Pope uh, was, in, was in Europe and the United States was ascendant and there was fear of communist takeover in Italy, uh, Frank Murphy was was entertained by the Pope and was lauded by the Pope. So he uh, he was very well known at the time. Uh, if you go to his house in Harbor Beach, you'll see all sorts of awards and plaques from Catholic groups uh, to Frank Murphy. Any other questions from everyone in our audience? Thank you very much for letting me uh, yeah. speak to you. It's been a, a real pleasure for me. Thank you for, for putting together this three-part program for us about Frank Murphy. It is much appreciated. Uh, we hope to see all of you tomorrow night for our interview with Yigal Arzeri. And for tonight, we're going to sign off. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.